Hi everybody and thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Alice and I'm from the communications team at Moors for the Future Partnership and today I'm joined by Jackie Ragg who is our Youth Engagement Officer. Uh, so this is the fourth in the series of the Bogtastic webcasts which we're doing in lieu of um, the Bogtastic Van events which would normally be going to at this time of year. Uh, so the webcasts are part of the More Life 2020 project which is funded by the EU Life Programme. Um, during the session today, which will be a mini, mini lesson, there will be the opportunity to answer polls in the right hand panel. And also, if you have any questions, if you'd just like to type those into there, and also Jackie will be asking a few questions during the lesson today. So pop your answers into that panel there. We'll be aiming for about 20 to 25 minutes for the presentation today, and then we'll be going on to questions at the end. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Jackie. Thanks, Alice, and uh, thanks to you people for joining us this morning. I know it's really nice outside and you're probably keen to get out there, but hopefully you're going to enjoy today um, and you'll be coming back next week uh, for the second instalment of mini lessons. Um, just to mention, I have planned this as a way of linking to GCSE um, geography and science um, because Blanket Bog Habitat's really good study as part of GCSE science and geography. However, if you're just interested in Blanket Bogs, this is a really good place to start to learn a little bit about the habitat and how it works. Um, so hopefully there's a mixture of people here that will really enjoy it. Um, they're a globally rare and very important habitat that's very close to my heart, obviously working for most of the future. Um, so hopefully you'll learn a lot and hopefully you'll get involved. So if you are live, um, do get involved. If you're not watching live, obviously you can't get involved, but you can also contact most of the future and I'm sure I'll be able to get back to you with some answers. OK, so let's have a look at what we're actually looking at today in our mini lesson. Um, I'm just going to explain a little bit about why bother studying blanket bog habitats, um, what's so interesting about them, why they're so important. And then we're going to cover three key terms um, that are really important in science and geography, but just generally to understand how important ecosystem knowledge is and um, how important it is to understand how everything links together in an ecosystem. So we'll look at ecosystem uh, and two key terms, abiotic and biotic factors, which come up in, um, in your studies uh, if you are studying GCSE. Um, lastly, if we get time, we're going to look at how what some of the abiotic and biotic factors in a habitat of blanket bog interact um, to lead to peat formation. Um, now, if you'd not heard the word peat before, um, it's a type of soil and it's not, I mean, obviously we, we all know someone called peat, hopefully, and we can, you know, have a little giggle about that. But yes, it is a soil. It's spelled a bit differently to the, the name peat as well. So that should help make the distinction. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is to see about how we can get people involved and find out a little bit about what you've heard about blanket bogs. So um, you should see a poll popping up in the uh, right hand side and it's just a quick yes or no answer. Have you heard of blanket bog habitat before? It's not a common habitat for people to talk about so I'd expect to see some no's in there um, but obviously you know don't don't be shy. If you haven't heard of it, please, please say. Plus, I'll feel like I've really made some, you know, a ground and achieved a lot if I've taught some people who didn't know about Blanket Bog. Um, just while the answers are coming in, um, that, in fact, they're nearly all in now. Um, let's just have a, a little look about why we would look at Blanket Bogs and then I'll share the results with you all. Um, in terms of blanket bog, it's quite a specific type of habitat and it falls under like a wider category, which is um, peatland. And peatland is, if you split it up, peat and land, a place where there's peat on the land is a peatland habitat. Um, if you think about woodland, woodland is quite general and then you have different types of woodland. It's the same with the blanket bog. It's a type of peatland um, and it falls in that category. So in the world, peatlands actually are the largest natural store of carbon. So and that's on land. So it says terrestrial there. It means on land. So um, on land, they actually store more carbon than any other habitat. 
um, which is massively important. And you're probably all thinking about climate change when I say carbon, and that is why they are so important in that in that respect because they do um, they're massive massive defences against climate change um, to balance out uh, the carbon cycle. So. Um, just linking back to those peatlands in the UK, it's actually 15% of the UK that's covered in peatland habitat. And then just to go a little bit more specific into that blanket bog habitat we're looking at today, the UK actually has 13% um, of the blanket bog habitat out of the whole world store of that habitat. Now, just to put that in perspective, the UK is about 0.2% of the land mass um, on, on the world. So obviously that is quite a large percentage, 13%. We've got a real stronghold of blanket bog habitat here, which is why we should have a look at it and learn a bit about it. Let's have a look at the poll then. It's 70-30. So 70% um, of the people listening have heard of blanket bog before and 30% haven't heard of blanket bog before. So um, that's quite interesting and hopefully those that everyone in that um, poll will learn a bit more about it today okay just looking at the key characteristics I'm not going to go into too much detail about this and we have actually put um, the slides out as a handout that people can download and I've put some in extra activities that you can do um, if you want to learn a bit more and maybe just to kind of expand your knowledge so that this is a good place to start to do that Okay, so um, just starting uh, with the picture, um, in the middle you can see a picture of a blanket bog um, habitat and what you might see if somebody took you out to show you blanket bog habitat. You'll notice it's, well you might notice it's in an upland area, so in the Peak District um, and the South Pennines, much of the upland is smothered in a layer of peat um, this soil we've started talking about it's very in depth it's not all the same depth everywhere but a lot of the upland in those areas is smothered in peat um, and where those conditions are right the habitat that we've got is blanket bog um, it's not just the Peak District and South Pennines, of course, and a lot of other areas um, in the UK are, are, you know, have uplands that are smothered in peat. So um, that's a nice, nice thing to look into after the session. Um, so just looking at the characteristics, I'll start at the top with the nutrient level. Nutrients, obviously, massively important in a habitat um, for the plants that live there. Um, to be able to access and in a blanket bog it's actually really challenging the nutrient levels are really low for plants there's not very much nutrients available for the plants to absorb so that does bring some challenges um, in terms of where the water comes from in a blanket bog some of you might have guessed with the word blanket bog people associate bogs with it being wet and it is very wet the water comes from the sky now I've put on the diagram rainfall but actually it could be snow it could be sleet it could be hail any form of precipitation which is water coming from the sky to the ground that's where the blanket bog gets the water from so it's not getting water from the ground under the ground and it's not getting water from a river running into it that's quite an important part for a blanket bog habitat um, We've talked about the soil and the peat. It could be very, very in depth, but blanket bogs in the UK can get to as deep as six metres. So the, the depth of the peat underneath the blanket bog can be as much as six metres, which takes a hell of a long time to form. And we'll look at that in a in a bit, another slide. I've said it's not everywhere in the UK. The areas where you find blanket bog tend to be cool areas and wet areas so the western side of the country does tend to get a lot higher rainfall there's more upland areas and it's where the prevailing wind comes from you do get more rainfall on that side so wet and cool that's the climate um, for the, the blanket bog habitat in the UK that links us on really well to the water it's very important that blanket bogs do get a lot of rainfall obviously we've said they're fed by rain um, and it's very important that they're particularly wet so we've got a key term um, at the bottom there which is water table uh, I don't know if anyone's heard of that term before you can pop yes or no in the box and type it in if you fancy because I'm just going to tell you a little bit about that term so 
it's actually a bit of a clunky definition, uh, which I find hard to visualize. So the definition of water table is the level below which the ground is saturated with water. So I'm just going to get my glass of water here. So if you imagine in this glass of water, it's going to be a bit of a stretch for imagination but just imagine that this is the surface the top of the glass is the surface of the ground that we walk on and then under the ground here there's a certain area that's dry and isn't full of water and there's a bit of the ground that's actually full of water or saturated and this bit here is the water table so just like the water in the glass it can go down it can also go up as well if i fill it up so the water table isn't fixed it moves up and down and below it the ground is saturated above it there's the the ground isn't saturated hopefully that helps with the term water table um, the last two elements, quite an important one here, typical blanket bogs, the soil, the water in the soil is low pH, it's acidic. So an average blanket bog water you might expect to be around 4, the pH of 4. So it's quite low pH and quite acidic, like the pH of tomato juice, which is the example I find on all the guides I look at. Um, so. The last thing about the vegetation, we'll look a bit more detail in the plants uh, shortly. So you don't tend to see in the UK many trees on blanket bogs, um, tends to be low growing vegetation and some really amazing um, bog mosses called sphagnum. And uh, they're really important in forming the pea and in the blanket bog habitat. OK, so let's um, move on and now we can have a look at one of our key terms. Now, I've not mentioned it too much to this point, but an ecosystem is something that, you know, we can't escape. They're everywhere. They're small. You know, a plant pot could be an ecosystem or, you know, the whole planet is full of global scale ecosystems or it could just be a farmer's field. So everything, you know, you can break down into that ecosystem. Um, understanding the key terms really just about um, seeing some invisible connections between what's ex what exists in a habitat. So the key term here we've got is a community of living things, plants, animals, bacteria, interacting with each other and their physical environment. So the physical environment could be, um, you know, a the rocks they're living on or the water they're living in or the air that they use to photosynthesize or breathe, depending on uh, what they are. So it's all about bringing everything in that you can't see um, and thinking about how it's all connected, which is so important in today's world where we do affect ecosystems and our understanding of ecosystems and how everything connects is crucial to be able to live, um, you know, in more in harmony with the natural world. Um, so let's have a look at the picture. Um, first of all, just kind of you can see again we're in a bit of a an upland area there's some water in the picture you can also if you look in the center of the picture you'll be able to see some of what we've been talking about um which is the peat so um yeah so if you look at the peat here uh, in the middle um i hope i think someone said they can't see my video but i hope you can see the actual powerpoint itself so if i've disappeared and but you can see the powerpoint that's that's quite helpful um good so the peat itself is really dark and it stands out quite a lot when you see it um when you're out in in a blanket bog habitat so um there's some bits on the picture there that are invisible that we can't see, but we know are there. So there's some animals that are going to exist in this blanket bog habitat. So just to make it um, a bit easier for us to think about the ecosystem, I've added some really um, well drawn, I hope you agree, um, animals. So uh, let's have a look, see if anyone can recognise any of the animals on there that I've lovingly drawn. Um, there's some that are quite well camouflaged. If you can recognize any, type it in the box and let's see. And if no one recognizes anything, I'll just tell you what they are. <laughs> oh, there's an owl. Someone said an owl. Yes. Uh, oh, good. Oh, I've got a frog as well. I think, I, I, I mean, it could be a frog or a toad. I was going for toad, but it's looking quite green. So I'm going to have, I'm going to happy with frog. 
Yes, I've, there's a slug. Right, that's good. Uh, oh, right, somebody's mentioned a wading bird. Martha's mentioned um, curlew. Um, that's a, a bird you would definitely see in this kind of habitat, but it's a different bird here. It is a wading bird, um, but it's called a golden plover. Um, really lovely bird to see if, if you're out in that kind of habitat and you'd be very lucky as well and to see one because you know they are beautiful um so we've got the bird at the top is an owl um thanks robbie it's a short-eared owl so it's a bird of prey um that you know hunts on blanket bogs and there's also a spider i'm glad people have seen it now that spider is quite well disguised um at the bottom and it's an orb weaver spider it's a four spot orb weaver and um, it's a female females are more colorful than the males and actually the reason it's quite well camouflaged is the the females can change color to adapt to their uh, natural surroundings so um, the female here is a bit yellow but they can actually be a bit greeny or a bit reddy um it takes a bit longer than a chameleon it might take days for them to change color but it's an interesting thing about the spiders there so chance for people to get involved again well done for spotting all those um just thinking about how these different species could be affected and how the whole habitat could be affected by a different factors i'm glad you can see me again beth <laughs> um so really what I want you to do now is I want you to think about those factors that might affect the habitat itself. So um, I'll just, I don't want to give any examples to take away good answers. So can anyone think of a factor that could affect the animals, the plants, the habitat itself um, and in the picture? If anyone wants to type anything in, that's when you can just pop a type it in the box. If you can think of a factor that could water level, good, light, too much water, definitely. So we've got water level in there. Um, if you think back to that where I like listed the things around the edge as well, can anyone think, oh, wildfire, that's a good one. Yes, definitely. We've got global warming in there, climate change. So the, the temperature and the rainfall could affect it. That's a lot of good answers. Um, yes. Oh, very specific there, Barry. I like it. pH level, that was on the diagram before. So someone's been paying attention. <laughs> Great. So um, I've just added some on to kind of build that picture of the ecosystem. And that's the, the key understanding we're trying to get from this. So here we are. So I've added some of the factors on that might affect um, this particular ecosystem. So we've got light, air, competition. That's actually just could be competition for light. I've drawn some little plants to the left there that could be competing with each other for light. Um, the climate, we talk about climate, that includes rainfall or precipitation and temperature. Um, so that's both on there the, the sun's on there as well the light level obviously really important because this ecosystem this this is driven by the energy from the sun so that's where the in, initial energy input comes in to this ecosystem that everything else is built on so we've got predation in there as well that that short-eared owls notice something else that i've drawn in the bottom corner um i don't know if anyone can see that next to the water it's a rather startled looking mammal next to the water can anyone tell what it is or guess what it might be it's a small mammal brown it's not a, it's a vole it's it's a water vole next to the water so um it could have been any of those, to be fair, though. It's not exactly a scientific drawing. It looks rather startled because it's about to be eaten by a short-eared owl. So that's predation. But also the vole itself eats as well, but it's a herbivore. So it's a feeding relationship with the vegetation. So that's affecting the ecosystem itself. The last thing I've put on there is soil. That's a bit of a, an interesting one because it's got lots of different components to it. So soil isn't just soil. There's so much more to it. And there's so many different elements that make a soil what it is. One being microorganisms. So microorganisms, if you break it up, micro, really small, organisms, living things. So bacteria, tiny organisms you find in the soil, very important in in soil uh, functioning well so it's your turn to get involved again now so um 
looking at that diagram, I want to see if we can learn our new key terms, which are abiotic and biotic. Um, so can anyone see any factors on there that they think are living factors? So um, biotic means living. So can anyone type any factors in they can see on the diagram that they think are living factors to do with life? Annabelle, competition and predation. Very good. Well done. Yes, the golden plover itself, the animals. Yes, everything that's gone up, microorganisms, predation, feeding, all living factors. Really good. What about non-living then? Any Anyone see any that are non-living factors on there? Type them in. Fire away. Yes. Light, air, light, water, precipitation. Good. That's good. There's one come up there that um, is going to always be a challenge for, for thinking about whether it's living or non-living. And that's why I've put some stuff under it in brackets. And that's soil. Because the soil's got those different components in it. We can't see it as living or non-living, really, if we look at it in a big whole chunk, because it's got living elements to it. So soil pH, non-living, soil nutrients, non-living, but soil my, my, microorganisms, living. So you have to kind of think about soil in, in a few more pieces and, and before we can put it together. pH, yeah, non-living, well done. Okay, so hopefully, let's have a look at the answers there. I've circled them for you. So the non-living is red and the living is blue. There's lots more to think about, but if you think about that picture, and come to this point, you can really see um, the ecosystem itself and the inner workings of how everything's connected. So if you think about, if you change one of those things, like the climate, for example, which is what I think Martha mentioned, um, um, that will really affect the whole workings of the ecosystem and everything in it. Because even though the, the connections are invisible, they're very much there. Um, and nothing exists on its own in isolation. It all impacts everything else. So if the climate changes, then that is obviously going to have an impact. And we can see that happening, obviously, in the world now. So that's why these habitats are so important, because they can actually um, help to limit that. OK, so just to put that those key terms there, just so we've got them and we've really demonstrated we know them, but biotic factors, living things um, in the ecosystem. So it might be that it's about the it's something to do with living things like competition or predation. But, um, you know, they are still biotic factors and abiotic factors. I've put rocks there. It's always a good example because soil is a bit more complicated. So um, you have to break that down. So soil pH, we could put in abiotic, but soil microorganisms, we would put in biotic. OK, so hopefully that makes makes sense to people. And, and it looks like it from all the answers popping up. OK, so the last thing we're going to look at before we have some questions is how those biotic or living factors and those abiotic or non-living factors in that blanket bog come together to form peat. This is one of the things that obviously peatlands in general, this is what sets them apart from all the other habitats. The conditions that have formed that peat, we're going to look at now. Um, and it really links into, if you've ever looked at nutrient cycles in a woodland, so how the leaves fall from the trees and get broken down um, by uh, a wood louse, for example, and then into the soil and then broken down again further for the trees to absorb. It's quite a straightforward cycle, whereas in a blanket bog habitat, that just doesn't happen. And that's what makes the habitat quite unique in forming this peat um, uh, under the ground. So we're going to look under the ground. So if you look at the picture at the top, you'll notice um, some features of the picture. It's quite wet in general, the habitat. Can anyone see any plants they recognise on there? Let's see if anyone can see any plants they can recognise. Type away if you can see any plants you recognise. Yes, cotton, cotton grass, lovely, fluffy cotton grass, really nice. It's actually um, 
called cotton grass, but it's actually a mem member of the, the sedge family, just to keep things simple. Somebody's recognized sphagnum moss. Well done, Martha. So that brings me into the bottom left corner. Well done, Elliot. The bottom left corner is a big carpet of sphagnum moss. And it looks quite bumpy, um, and that's because of the way the sphagnum grows. So let's have a look how the sphagnum grows. The top of the sphagnum, in, in the picture on the right-hand side that you can see, it's really green. It's got a bobbly head on the top, which makes it stand apart from other mosses. And that is where the sphagnum actually grows from. It grows from the top. Okay, so all the new growth is at the top. And if you go down the plant towards the bottom of the picture of the plant, there's no green there. OK, so you've got a stem going down and then you've got branches coming off the side. There's no green there at the bottom. Um, and if we look at what's going on under the ground, we'll see why there's no green at the bottom. So in the top is um, if you just follow the sphagnum down to the little diagram, you can see there's a living sphagnum moss at the top and that's where the green is. Why is it green? I wonder. Some people might be thinking the answer to this or writing it. It's green because it's photosynthesizing. So it's using the sun's energy, taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere to grow, to make its body, its sphagnum plant. So it's taking that carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and it's green because of the chlorophyll. Well done, David. Um, and it's using it to grow. So when you get a bit further down, if you imagine under the canopy in a tropical rainforest, for example, not very much light gets through. All that sphagnum, the little bobbly heads are all knitted together. There's not much light getting down into that second layer where it's yellow. And that's because um, of that layer there. So it's yellow because it's not photosynthesizing, because it's not getting any light. Go a bit further down and that's where it's decomposing. And that means it's di it's dying and it's decomposing. But going back to this glass of water, that water table is going up and down. So in the bit below the water table, what haven't I got in this glass? I might have got oxygen in, in form of H2O water, but I don't have air in this because there's no space for it. It's full of liquid. And that is just the same as this bit of the diagram below the water table on the right hand side. You can see it's waterlogged, which means there's no oxygen and it's also acidic. That means decomposition is either very, very slow or very interrupted because the water table keeps moving up and down. And that means we get peat. And that is because um, the sphagnum isn't decomposing properly and uh, it's massively full of carbon. So that whole layer under there, which could be, like we said, as much as six metres, is full of partially decomposed peat. Um, and also it's waterlogged as well. There's a lot of water in that area. Um, I've just put on there about how slow it forms. And then we've actually got a little bit of time at the end if you want to stay to ask some questions. Um, so it forms roughly one millimeter a year. So if we've got six meters of peat, can anyone work out how many years it would take to form that six meters? That's thousand millimeters in every meter. It's six. 6,000 years, we got an answer so quick as well. Well done, maths whiz. 6,000 years it could be as, um, as much as. So that's really interesting and also very distinctive as to, in terms of nutrients because the nutrients are getting locked up. They're not available in the top like they would be in a woodland soil. So hopefully that's been a really good insight.